a very brave man and a good friend of the program. Steve Friend is joining us. He is uh, from the Center of Renewing America fellow. Uh, he's a fellow at the sorry at the Center for Renewing America. Uh, he's also the FBI whistleblower uh, that objected to being you know put on to duty to investigate grandmothers as as domestic terrorist. He blew the whistle, and uh, the rest of it is history. Welcome to the program, Steve. How are you? I'm doing well, Grant. Thanks for having me on today. You bet. So you were with uh, the FBI, um, and uh, I know it's not the same, but I think you probably could comment on this. I'm not hearing anything satisfying coming from the FBI or the Secret Service on the assassination attempt. There's three things. Assassination attempt of Donald Trump. Uh, the guy that they ju- they just let in, they knew he was on the terror list, and they just let him in anyway, who was coordinating an assassination on Donald Trump. And then the third comes out of uh, Massachusetts this weekend, where Kamala Harris was on stage someplace at an event, and the Secret Service and local police needed a bathroom, so they covered up somebody's private security on their business and then picked the lock went in, used their bathrooms, occupied the space for hours, and then closed back to the shop, didn't lock it back up, but closed it. The lady came on Monday, and she's like, what the hell happened here? Uh, that's against the law, isn't it? Oh, absolutely it is. And I think if you or I were to engage in any sort of activity, that there would be criminal charges against us, at the very least, for some sort of trespass. But I think what these three elements that you're talking about expose more than anything else is what I like to dub the myth of competence that we all sort of have in our federal law enforcement agencies, because in pop culture, TVs and movies, shows that you consume, uh, the the uh, the characters in those shows and movies, they're, they're really sophisticated and, and really great at their job, and they're hunting down the criminals, and they're chasing them down the back alleys and slapping the handcuffs on, and then they just fade to black. But in reality, uh, these agencies have now devolved into essentially DMVs with guns and badges. And that's why wow. when it comes to the, the Trump assassination attempt. You know, there's all these theories that are out there. Um, and, you know, you can count me sort of in the, in the clan of people that believe that incompetence was heavily involved in it. And I think that mm-hmm. there's one sort of presupposition that has gone into that, that so many people have their questions about, and, and rightfully so. But we are presupposing that the Secret Service is always great at its job, and these failures oh, I think they're terrible. are explained. I, and yes, I, I think that these failures are happening at every single event, and it's just because of the providential nature of our as, as a country, and then also because of the myth of competence that nobody's really tried and tested them, which is why going forward, I think there's probably a heightened risk to Donald Trump for any of these any, any of these events that he's going to hold. Uh, but to pivot to the the second issue with the the FBI and uh, investigating this uh, this assassination attempt. I think one of the most disturbing elements that hasn't been picked up on was when the deputy director of the FBI, Paul Abate, uh, said that they were going to investigate it as domestic terrorism. And that, to me, is uh, to the layperson, seems reasonable. You don't want to have blinders on. But being a subject matter expert here, the FBI is now going to slap a classified label on this investigation, and they're not going to be able to be transparent because you don't have a need to know. You don't have a security Jeez. clearance. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Congressman. Can't comment on an ongoing investigation. So that's that's tremendously disturbing. And then the last thing that I, I definitely want to get to is this Pakistani national. Now, this is what I like to call the playbook that the FBI has been running the last two and a half decades, particularly since 9-11 where essentially what they do to justify their existence as a bureaucracy, as a self-looking ice cream cone, they will identify a vulnerable person, an emotionally disturbed, maybe someone with radical intentions, but not capable of carrying forward an actual attack without the involvement of the FBI. They'll identify them, use confidential human sources, use undercovers, and then groom them for as long as it takes to engage or at least agree to engage in an activity that can be labeled as terrorism, and then they will arrest them. And the added wrinkle here was that they imported this Pakistani through the border. They sponsored him arriving. arriving. The FBI Dallas office actually was the signee on him arriving, and it wasn't just to slap the cuffs on him. They followed him and 
orchestrated this plot that could never have happened without the involvement of the government for three months and then justify their existence with this big dismantlement stat, which is also tied to their quotas. This is just the eight, the FBI version of Fast and Furious, but except with the exception of you know, being guns with the ATF, we are now running terrorists so that we can justify our existence as an agency. So he was supposed to leave right after he had set something up before the uh, assassination. Um, so did they, because I don't even know if I've read the what they had busted other than him. Did they actually bust something up? The plot is completely absurd, Glenn. I've read through the affidavit. This is an individual who was essentially indigent, didn't have the finances, and we're led to believe from the FBI that he arrived here uh, and then just happened the first person that he had a conversation with was an informant for the government about soliciting hitmen to carry forward not only assassinations, but he wanted uh, dozens of people to have protests that were going to be cover while they did reconnaissance. He wanted to get people that were going to steal documents and thumb drives from government figures and all for the low, low price of $5,000, which he didn't actually have. And he was doing things like uh, asking the the informant to put his phone in a drawer while they had conversations. I mean, I, that's not a Faraday bag. It's not really operational security. These illusions of grandeur that he had to me indicate that he was a prime person that the FBI likes to target, the people who are vulnerable. And, and, and not for nothing, you know, let's just say he's a, you know, he's a bad guy. Um, what's to say that they don't import him here? And uh, he just says, you know, this plot that I have, doesn't sound like it's going to be achievable. I'll just grab a butcher knife and stab the next infidel that I see. And then the FBI should be on the hook for that. So this is them believing in their own competence that certainly nothing bad will happen while we have them on the hook for three months. And they've been lucky. We've been lucky that nothing worse has happened. But I think the bottom line is that the FBI is inventing these cases so that they can go to Congress and say, look, how all the good work we have done here. Why don't you give us enhanced funding? Why don't you give us enhanced tools? Think of all the good work we could do, like Lindsey Graham wants to do now, and that is giving the FBI backdoor access to encrypted communications, uh, because Jeez. that way the FBI can circumvent the Fourth Amendment. Oh, my gosh. Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham. Um, so, so let me see if I have this right. W- was this... A uh, guy that they picked up uh, or, you know, uh, finally arrested and told us all about it. Was this just a distraction from the assassination? I think the timetable works out to be that he was arrested on July 12th. And the assassination attempt happened on the 13th, which to me certainly explains the, uh, the messaging that we got about this Iranian threat. Uh, because the FBI was really super concerned about right. someone who they groomed to uh, engage in a terrorism, Jeez. which never was going to happen and really didn't have their eye on the ball. And then you know, we can get into the speculation about a character like Crooks, who, not for nothing, kind of strikes me as sitting squarely within the profile of someone who would be recruited and targeted for grooming to engage in something that he was not predisposed to do. And then maybe did the thing that I just talked about. But instead of grabbing the butcher knife and stabbing an infidel, grabbed his dad's AR and said, I'm going to take a shot at a candidate for office. So who is, I mean, who should uh, pay for, for this? I saw that the, I think it was the fire chief of uh, Butler County just resigned over this because of staging and everything else. I, I don't, I could be wrong. I don't think it's the local law enforcement's place. I mean, you know, when the Secret Service come in, they usually just come in and just say, here's what you're doing, and you do that, and don't ask any questions. Um, uh, you know, who, whose fault really was this? Who should pay for this? There's going to be a lot of accountability hot potato as it comes to this assassination attempt, because you could see Kimberly Cheeto get up there and say, the buck stops with me, but, you know, it was really local law enforcement's job. And, and just having been at both levels, you could easily see that roof being something where, the locals said, hey, that should be covered. And the Secret Service said, okay, we'll cover it. And then it didn't get covered. And then they're just looking back and forth at each other saying, hey, that's your job. No, that's your job. And then meanwhile, it doesn't get covered at all. But I think ultimately, because the Secret Service is supposed to be the chief agency there who's calling the shots, 
it needs to be them who falls on this. And there needs to be an independent investigation because I don't trust the FBI. And it's not just a personal animus. The FBI has a track record for investigating assassination attempts like the 2017 congressional baseball shooting where the shooter was a Bernie Sanders Mm -hmm. supporter, showed up at the ball field and asked where the Republicans were and then proceeded to shoot Steve Scalise. And the FBI said that's not an assassination attempt. That's suicide by cop. So there needs to be an independent investigation, maybe funded here, could be used in the congressional uh, leverage here for the for the upcoming budget. Uh, it could also be a request from the Pennsylvania State Police, because I know there's a federal nexus here, but it was in their backyard. And I don't see any reason why they couldn't conduct a thorough investigation. I would trust them far more than the FBI, which is going to say this was domestic terrorism, perhaps, or perhaps we already had a domestic terrorism case open on crooks. Either way, we can't talk about sources and methods. This is an ongoing investigation. Maybe we'll give you something here uh, in a decade when nobody is really paying attention. So um, one one last thought. The woman in Massachusetts that had her business just taken over um, uh, without her permission, without her even being there and knowing it, uh, they covered the camera, they broke in, picked the lock, and, and went in and spent hours in there just because I guess they could. Um, She's not pressing charges. Uh, she says, you know, I'm really angry. I feel violated. But I, you know, I don't, you know, they have a job to do. No. If people don't stand up, I think that's a violation of the uh, the Third Amendment. I mean, that never gets any attention. I think that's the violation of the Third Amendment. But it's certainly breaking and entering. And if people don't push back and say, no, I'm sorry, if that were anyone else, you'd be in jail today. So I, I'm sorry. I might like you guys. I understand your situation, but you cannot do that because it'll never stop. This is the natural downstream consequences of what we experienced in 2020 when we were said you had to stay home and stay safe and shut down your non-essential business that you used to feed your family and pay your mortgage. And this is the chilling effect that it has. And I share your sentiment about the Third Amendment. It'll be interesting to see an energetic attorney take that up. But the government yeah. does not respect your civil liberties, does not respect the Bill of Rights. And this is just another example of the fact that they are willing to impede on those just for their own convenience. I mean, how hard is it to find a bathroom? Uh, Steve, thank you so much. Thanks for everything you do. Stay safe. Uh, Steve Friend, uh, former uh, and current whistleblower uh, on the FBI. 